everybody, and welcome to This Week in Innovation. Today, we're going to do something a little different. I'm launching a new series entitled Startups of NRF. There's 103 startups spread between the Innovation Lab as well as the Startup Zone, and I want to see how many we can talk to. I'll use the same set of questions, all, uh, seven questions, and I'll keep each program to less than 15 minutes. First up today, I will be speaking with uh, Spencer Keeboom, founder and CEO of Pollen Technologies. Pollen has developed a returns platform that taps into the gig economy and the legions of drivers that operate in, in cities and towns across the, the land. Pollen will be exhibiting at NRF at booth 66 in the Startup Zone. So give it a listen, let us know what you think, and make sure you swing by the Startup Zone and say hi. Hello, everybody, and welcome to our new series, The Startups of NRF. And today I have Spencer Kaboom, founder and CEO of Pollen. So, Spencer, welcome to the show. I'd uh, love to hear what you're up to. Thanks, Jeff. I appreciate it. Yeah, so pretty simple. We're focused on returns, and we're leveraging the outdated returns process with our call it proprietary technology, and it allows for easy porch pickup scheduling through existing courier and carrier networks and the infrastructure that's already in place. Okay, so the second you say returns, most people in retail groan. So unpack what the problem is, how big the problem is, and how'd you come about getting into this space? Because of all the things in retail and e-com, returns are probably the least sexy thing I can think of. How'd you get into yeah, this? They're the underbelly, that's for sure. And then the beauty of it is there's some great companies out there that are actually solving the issue of, of reselling these goods on secondary markets. Maybe some screens that are showing the consumer, hey, this is a label that you can maybe utilize or maybe even some efficiency aspect. Our area that we're, we focus on specifically is really between consumer into supply chain. And... It's not about increasing the returns. It's about expediting that process of the consumer placing something into a supply chain. And I think we can all say that we've had a return sit in the back of our car, mm -hmm. uh, not for a couple of days, but for a couple of weeks, something sit in a closet or on a kitchen counter. And those are good paperweights. But that process is really over 20 plus days. And the benefits that can happen by uh, expediting that process to increasing turns, increasing actually purchase conversions for these folks to minimize that final hurdle to the consumer is pretty astounding. So who, how does the consumer get engaged with you? Are you working with the retailer specifically? Is an application? How do, you know, I'm the worst and I'm returning. I have a whole office full of stuff I should have returned. How would, yeah. how do I work with you? So the simplest way to say it is we're B2B serving C partner with retailers. We wind up on the back end, call it behind the initial security curtain of a membership, however they want to incentivize. You click the item that you're going to be returning like you would standardly through their process. They've essentially said, yes, this item can be returned. Yes, this is okay. And then you see a button that's there that says simply front door. You click that button, you schedule your date and time, reminder text, emails, et cetera, go out. Retailers have the opportunity to even customize these messages through our dashboards. They have the head visibility aspect as well, but it really is that great story was we were running our pilots and MP, initial pilots and MVP more locally. Here just in Atlanta with some small retailers, I picked up a return for a woman who was 72 years old. Her name was Mary, I remember, and she had no problem scheduling it because it really is a date and a time. So your company literally physically picks up the return? Yeah, so what we actually do is leverage the, the existing gig ecosystem, okay. as well as the leveraging the existing infrastructure of the FedEx and UPS office locations as well. And so that allows us to have maximum coverage in all these markets for any retailer, not being limited by, by a certain region because we have our own drivers and we have to have a certain kind of overhead or app. And our technology, what it does is it's... It allows us to essentially batch these goods for drivers. We, we then send them out to our to the gig networks, like your Uber, Lyfts, DoorDashes, roadies of the world. And this allows them then to offer these pickups in conjunction with their other offerings, like food delivery and ride share, the day before for drivers, which gives them really the big issue to them as well as the platform consistency for these guys as well. And there was around 3.3 billion items returned through the fashion and apparel industry alone in 2020, which offers a huge pickup opportunity for them. Does your company help the person with the physical return packaging it, or is it literally just, it's on the doorstep, you pick it up and go and... Yeah, so again, even cooler, right? There's no label, there's no packaging needed. You could package it up. We're gonna open it up anyways and take it out once the oh, driver gets embarrassed. But we actually, how we quote, call it, make money as everybody's probably like, how are you making money if you're going A to B and how much does this cost? For a retailer, it's actually 
essentially the same price as what they already pay, unless maybe it's a buck or two more, just depending on where we're picking items up and their volumes. And at the same time, what we do is we consolidate these goods as a, at a nano consolidation level, as I call it right now, because micro consolidation has kind of gotten into macro consolidation with Amazon and Nicole's. But we nano consolidate these goods in our technology and allow the driver to walk in and place everything in one bag and we tell it where to go and one label and all the information is transferred to that label and off it goes back to the uh, first proper dispositions. How do you define your space? So it's returns, returns management? Yeah, so it's really more, call it purchasing maybe management as well at the end of the day. What you can do for companies in getting goods back from a refillment perspective, aside probably from your big three, your Walmarts, Targets, and your Amazons, they're purchasers, period. They're not necessarily looking for refillment. They're handling these the, the returns um, by just liquidation at the end of the day. I and mean, that's where your other folks like your Opteros, Genco's, Inmars come into play as well, who are handling a lot of this secondary market aspects. But for us, we come into play for these retailers where we have an opportunity to remove that hurdle. A shopping cart abandonment sits between a 60 to 70%. It's not a matter of we can't get it fast enough. It could be same day delivery, it could be two day delivery at the end of the day. It's not because we can't go get our credit card off the counter or in our car anymore because that's a thumb or a face recognition or a PayPal button. It really comes down to what is the final hurdle. And that's the what if this doesn't fit? What if I don't like it? What if I'm shopping with somebody new and I have to go handle this return and deal with this, this procedural hassle that we've just become to call the norm that really is deterring consumers. One of our favorite statistics from over the thousand people we picked returns up for was, now granted, I'm not saying it's gonna be this number at the end of the day, but even if you can get a slice of it, it's tremendous for a retailer because we can all relate to selling. And that is that front door pickups for returns would minimize shopping cart abandonment up to 75%. Of so what it really stands out. So unpack that. Let me see if I understand what you're saying. If I, as a consumer, felt comfortable that I had a better and safer return, I would be less likely to abandon a shopping cart in the upfront part of the process? Yes. Yeah, interesting. Okay. So, and that that area, so granted, if it's a 70% for a retailer at this moment of time, so only 30% of everything that's put into a shopping cart for the entire year, let's call it, is essentially made through purchase where I put all in my information, use PayPal, use my face, Apple Pay, whatever it might be. Only 30 to 40% of those goods are actually pushed through to that point. The rest are left there, which is why we all know we get bombarded with emails. We got bombarded maybe with the text message now here and there as well. And at the same time, how these retailers want to market this is up to them. We white label it. It's their product, their consumer. We want to make sure that they have the opportunity to resell a good or bring them back to their website for another purchase. Ah, very interesting. So if I came to your booth at NRF, what's the story you're telling? What do you say? Um, returns suck. <laughs> <laughs> That's and, so and, we, and we can fix it. It's a problem. And when you uh, being in this in the industry and seeing what's going on, you hear all these solutions. Oh, I can reduce returns by X. I can reduce returns by X. Meanwhile, all it's done is this since the dawn of time. And there's value associated with the return policy. If you hear stories of somebody returning tires at a Nordstrom's, like these things are traveled by word of mouth. They delight the customer, makes them feel really good at the end of the day, knowing they don't have to worry about anything. And for us, return suck. It's a strong word, but it's a word that a retailer can relate to from an inventory perspective. They can relate to it from a monetary perspective. They can relate to it from a sales perspective. Then the consumer relates to it from the procedural hassle that's there as well. And by leveraging the returns market and bringing that convenience, it's not about necessarily enhance increasing the returns. It's about increasing the purchase, but also being able to use that inventory if it is being returned. Because now it's not out of season. You can get these goods back to you quicker. You have the opportunity where you're not the mercy of the consumer of not knowing when something's coming back. Because you can put the parameters as to when the scheduling windows are, when the dates are available for pickup. So you know that next week that you have X amount of goods coming back also in a consolidated manner to streamline the process for you on the back end. Yeah, so that's really interesting. I, I'm assuming there's probably a sustainability story mixed in here too as we start to really understand how I don't know how wasteful the retail process is. Do you have a story there? Yeah. 
essentially it's, it really books, dwindles down for these retailers on a scope three perspective where it's an indirect aspect, right? So consumer has to put a box, the label, those are indirect byproducts of these goods coming back to that retailer, which is essentially a scope three initiative right there. So for us, no label, no box, or essentially one label, one box for 10 to 15 goods. 20 goods at the end of the day. So we're minimizing the amount of labels that need to be created. We're also utilizing the driving armies that are already in existence. We're not adding, we're not adding a new platform. We don't have our own drivers. We don't do any of that. Um, what we utilize is the drivers that are already out there making these food deliveries, making these ride sharing opportunities where they have backhauling opportunities and they pass by at FedEx and UPS multiple times a day and routes where people are returning goods all the time. Yeah, that's really interesting because God, and that's just, that, that's got to make the the gig drivers a lot more efficient. And if the concept of a backhaul, just I love that. I, I, as an old supply chain guy, now that was such a big difference at Mervin's when we figured out how to do backhauls. So if we could do that in the gig economy, yeah. that makes a whole lot more sense. And these guys have to, they subsequently over incentivize their drivers in order to get them to even do a food delivery. Right. And if they have that consistency, then that driver is more inclined to make that delivery for a potential margin rather than a loss for these guys. And you're scheduling those pickups so drivers can fill their day in based on yeah, availability. It's, it's, yeah, cable company, wow. right? You're there between 8 to 12 and 12 to 4. Uh, you're reminded the evening before via text message and an email. You could reschedule via the email too. You're notified when the driver's on the way. So now you think food delivery. And you're notified when it's been picked up as well as the confirmation email. And that, again, is that all white labeled aspect where a retailer, um, I'm not going to, I'll just make up a company, right? Um, I'm not going to make them up, but let's just say it's Nike. For example, Nike sends that final text message that says, hey, Jeff, we picked up your return. Thanks for shopping with Nike.com, which is an opportunity for you to click there. Please use just do it 15 for 15% off your next purchase and check out this line. And that's an opportunity for them to do it where that texting and marketing was a flop in 19. But when you text through a service, it has an 85% higher engagement than any email. Wow. Interesting. Very interesting. I guess what you're going to say, but how do you see 2022 shaping up? Exciting, <laughs> busy, growth. We are, we are, January is exciting with what we have going on with, with the pilots that we're kicking off with folks as well. And it's NRF. We're excited for NRF. We're excited for the return suck campaign. We're excited for all these things. It's, it's, it's been a lot of fun and seeing what's going on in the markets. And I think it it dwindles down, Jeff, to at the end of the day, everybody's looking to to please and, and appease the consumer. And if the real winners from COVID, uh, aside from the ones who could adapt and move quickly, are, are the ones who had these conveniences in play, even though they may have been unbeknownst to us as consumers before. And now consumers are flipping over every stone trying to find anything that is more convenient to them at the end of the day. And this is an aspect where, yeah, convenience is at play, but there's a monetary gain to the retailer as well by bringing this kind of convenience that can solve the return issue. A lot of us in the analyst world are afraid to talk about the winners of COVID, but there clearly were winners of COVID. And they were the, the nimble, Alto be, being one example, Walmart, Target, Amazon, all the usual suspects. And so the idea is you need to be you need to be very flexible when you get into these. God, no one could have thought of what the impacts uh, of COVID, but having a yeah. digital platform that was flexible, allowed in-store pickup, all those equations. Yeah, interesting. Even, for example, curbside, right? Curbside is something where people adapted really quickly and why it's, well, it's some, kind of, some adapted really quickly. And that's some, our but, but, it, but, it, but it's, it's here to stay yeah. because numbers show that it's over, it's between a 35 to 50% walk-in rate for a consumer. So a consumer bought something curbside, they already paid for it. Now they're walking into a store at a 30 to 50% rate to buy something else that they even purchase via curbside. And meanwhile, just a fun story, God bless my local Coles, uh, who politely asked me to leave after a couple months. Coles is, uh, from the, the foot traffic aspect for a return, it's the biggest myth in retail. And I tracked thousands of people uh, a year ago, during and before COVID, and they had a 4% buy rate in the Coles. Of Amazon, people walking in for an Amazon return that at Coles, they had a 4% buy rate. Meanwhile, Amazon has figured out essentially where I go, this where it should go because there's a Whole Foods across the street and they had a 25% walk-in rate after the return. So you it's a punish goods base. So, and this is a great example for all my budding entrepreneurs out there. So you literally stocked a Kohl's, I take it. 
and you're you're watching people come in and return and then walk right out. You're literally standing in Coles doing that. Yeah, I, yeah. I also that's how I learned Amazon. So like, yeah. I got a cell phone case because I'm going. Well, there has to be a way to like make margin on this, and it really has to come down to consolidation. And what Amazon's doing at Coles, and how I don't mind saying it, they're just using them. And, and Coles is just taking it on the chin. And that's why when you walk into a Coles, there's a water bottles and Snickers bars. Now, when you do an Amazon return, because they want, they, they're like desperate for people to buy stuff because there's no, the purchase rate in a return is below 10% in a walk-in. That foot traffic means nothing. It's not, it doesn't warrant its existence. Let alone doesn't warrant the existence of how much room they're taking up in the back, which was a semi-truck. So they had 28 pallets on a semi-truck double stacked. And that being said, they had it backed up for five weeks at this Coles. So all that, all those pallets, whatever that is, 28 times five off the top, anybody else, 100, yeah, 140. So 140 pallets are stacked up back there. And that they're just taking up space in a Coles. And meanwhile, Amazon's getting my cell phone case back to Cincinnati for labor, logistic miles, all the above. And my, by the way, they validated it from a fraud perspective right then and there too, for $2.47, rather than slapping an $8, six, six seven, $8 label on it, plus plus everything else that comes along with it. Interesting. Wow, really good stuff. Hey, for the last couple of questions, we have a bunch of college students that listen to us. I'm doing a lot with the Center for Retail Transformation at Georgia Mission University, and I get this question asked all the time. So let me ask you, what advice would you give buddy, a budding entrepreneur? Surround yourself with a great team. A good group of people, I would say, is number one. Number two is um, listen and be respectful to when anybody's giving you advice. But that doesn't mean you have to do it their way. You always do it your way. Know how to Build, learn how to build communication skills that allow you to be respectful, maybe paint a different picture to figure out another way to do it. Because as the saying goes, there's a hundred different ways to skin a cat. But at the same time, if, if you do it your way and you take the advice in and, and you adjust accordingly, uh, you can hang your hat on that you did everything that you did and you did it your way. And, and that's what's most important. Now, oh, very cool. And last question, what skills do you use now that you wish you would have paid more attention to when you were younger? That's a good one. Let me see. I would say... I wish I would have listened a little. When I say listen, not like just listen, but really attentively listen and see how it can be applicable uh, to what I'm doing. The good news is I definitely listened and now I can make a lot of these things applicable as I've gotten older, which has definitely happened. And so the other skill that I would say is learn how to, I look at, I basically look at what we're doing as a bear with tons of sprints. We're not sprinting everywhere we go, but we do a lot of sprints and then we have to walk in order to catch our breath sometimes. And I think that's a, that's a good method. And I think it's methodical enough for us. And it's been methodical for me where it's not just slow and steady wins the race. It's fast and quick will win the race, but you have to know when you need to breathe. Yeah, very good. Hey, that's some great insights. How can people get in touch with you and what booth are you going to be at NRF? Yeah, we're at booth 66. You'll also definitely be seeing some return sucks arrow being <laughs> passed around. If you like a good koozie, we'll have some good ones that just say, Cold beer with thumbs up emoji, warm beer, <laughs> thumbs down emoji, and returnsuck.com. You can find me at Pollen's website, uh, pollenreturns.com, or even returnsuck.com. We're there as well. I'm on LinkedIn. I love to meet new people. I love to uh, get to know people as well when it's uh, genuine, like this scenario right here, Jeff. And yeah, my email is just my first initial S, last name Keyboom, K I E B O O M, at pollenreturns.com. Awesome. Thanks so much for your time today. I appreciate it. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks for having me. Thanks for tuning into today's episode. For more info, refer to the pod notes below. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider giving us a five-star rating and review. It really helps us grow. I'm your host, Jeff Roster, analyst at large. If you want to connect, follow us on Twitter at Jeff PR or at Brian Sathanation or connect with us on LinkedIn. Visit my website at roster.retail.com or brians at iterate.ai. Until next time, stay safe and have a great week.